Um, welcome everyone to all our viewers and thanks for tuning in. My name is Sally Clifton Parks and I'll be facilitating the webinar tonight. Our topic is algae, salt and solutions, water quality and gate management. And this is the third presentation in our four part webinar series. If this is your first webinar experience, please note that no one can see you or hear you. Um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that you have a chat button. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please type them in here and our um, presenters will answer them at the end of the presentation. Please make sure you select all attendees and panelists in the drop down arrow to send your questions to. When the webinar closes, you'll see that there's a two minute survey that pops up on your screen and we'd really appreciate your feedback by filling that in. Um, if we're going over time, I'll jump in and give you the chance to leave the webinar if you need to. Otherwise, if we have more questions, we'll continue on. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Linda Calliers from the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. Linda has been working on water quality in the vast Wanrat wetlands since 2017. She has over 20 years experience studying the chemistry of coastal environments in both Western Australia and the United States. Also joining us tonight will be Dr. Kath Lynch, who's going to help out with the Q&A session to answer any of your tricky questions. Um, Kath is the Revitalising Geograph Waterways Program Manager. So I'll hand over to Linda now for the presentation. Welcome, Linda. Thank you very much, Sally. I'll just share my screen. How does that look? Great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Sally, for your introduction and thank you very much to everyone for joining me this evening. I'm uh, very excited to give you a talk on the work we've been doing in the vast one of estuaries over the last five years that are aimed at trying to both understand and improve water quality within the estuaries. So let me make sure I can actually move my slides. Ah, sorry. No. Oh. Hang on. There we go. Um, hopefully that will continue. So the vast one up estuaries, as most of you know, are two beautiful estuaries located close to the city of Busselton, um, about two and a half hours south of Perth in Western Australia. And these estuaries are broad, shallow estuaries. Uh, the vast estuary is about seven kilometres long. One up is fairly similar. And these estuaries uh, terminate towards the, towards the coast in long, skinny channels. These estuaries are highly valued by the, both the local community and in, internationally. And here are just some pictures to show you why they're such beautiful and valued uh, wetlands or estuaries. Um, and probably the most obvious is they support a really large number of birds at particular types of the year, especially in December and January. And so high that, that in December and January, the vast water up wetlands have the highest density of water birds in Western Australia. Um, and because of those really high numbers, uh, the wetlands have a uh, Ramsar status, which means they're recognised by international conventions for their importance for water bird habitat. On a more local note, they also support the largest uh, breeding colony of our state emblem, the black swans. So highly valued, really beautiful wetlands, but just like other estuaries around the world, they really do show symptoms of uh, suffering under the pressure of uh, a growing human population. And here are some pictures from the vast one up estuaries. We can see on the lower left panel, we have discolored water, thick green, smelly water. And that's because of high concentrations of uh, algae or phytoplankton. These are small single celled organisms that uh, grow in abundance when the concentration of nutrients is high. And sometimes those phytoplankton produce toxins as well. And so they're generally referred to as harmful algal blooms. We also have conditions in the estuary where rather than phytoplankton blooms, we have macroalgal blooms. And that's in the upper right hand corner, we have thick accumulations of what looks like weed growing. And both the algal blooms and the macroalgal blooms are driven by high levels of nutrients. 
So the nutrients are typically nitrogen and phosphorus. They provide the food that um, these organisms need to grow. One of the problems with these organisms, as well as looking unsightly, is that when they die, they break down and the breakdown consumes oxygen. And so as they break down, they strip oxygen from the water and that makes it very hard for aquatic organisms to survive. The vast Wannerup has suffered from a, uh, seven fish kills in the last 10 years, you see on the right hand side, which just shows that the estuary's water quality is, is inadequate for supporting healthy fish life at certain times. So the, this is really unfortunate set of symptoms and the best way to try as a management agency to try and uh, uh, resolve some of these issues is to understand how the estuaries work. And so I wanna give you uh, a bit of an overview of that right now. So the vast water up, I've been referring to them as wetlands or estuaries. They are estuaries um, in that they receive freshwater flows from rivers and I'm showing the rivers here. Uh, many of these rivers drain either urban or agricultural land and so they tend to become nutrient enriched and so these rivers deliver high levels of nutrients to these estuaries. Um, the estuaries, the skinny channels at the end of the estuary um, join together at, uh, towards the coast and they flow, the water that enters the estuary flows out through that through a single um, ocean entrance that um, breaks through a sandbar at uh, Wannerup Inlet. So these two estuaries um, are exposed to the ocean through this relatively small channel through the sandbar. Now this uh, sandbar, um, just like many other West Australian estuaries, can close seasonally. And so when that happens, the estuaries are actually isolated from the ocean. Um, we also now mechanically open that uh, water up inlet ocean entrance if needed. So these estuaries are unique in that they share this single, single ocean entrance, but there are other factors that make them even more unique. And that's because they have surge barriers at both, the mouth, at both of their mouths. So just here's a beautiful aerial photo and um, there's the ocean entrance down there. And then the vast uh, surge barrier is very clear in the foreground of this photograph. These surge barriers are in place to uh, prevent seawater from flowing into the estuaries. And I'll say more about why they're essential shortly. But they're the only permanent surge barriers on estuaries in Western Australia. So very unusual situation. And the community has and scientists have long been aware that many of the water quality problems that I showed you in that previous slide often tend to focus around these surge barriers. And you can see that in this picture here, upstream of the surge barrier, we have uh, green pea soup like water and downstream, you can actually see the bottom, the water's much clearer. So the surge barriers are definitely been implicated in potentially somewhat causing those poor water quality issues that we often have. And so as um, part of this program, we've investigated um, how the surge barriers are impacting water quality. Before I give you some of the results of that program, let me just say a little bit more about the surge barriers because it's important to understand uh, what they do. And so the surge barriers, these were, they've been in place for a really long time. They were first installed in 1908 by the early settlers and they were installed to largely prevent seawater from flooding uh, adjacent agricultural land. Today, they're really important to um, protect Busselton and surrounding land from storm surge flooding. Busselton would flood um, under high ocean levels if it wasn't for the presence of these surge barriers. These surge barriers, relatively uh, simple construction, they're one-way flow structures. They let fresh flooding waters out, as shown in this picture. And, but then when ocean levels rise, those gates that are open in this picture are pushed closed and seawater can no longer get in. The structures that are um, present today were updated and constructed in 2004. And in 2004, there'd already been many decades of poor water quality. And so the gates were designed with a few additional features that you probably won't find on any other surge barriers. And that is they included a fish gate. The fish gate is just a small opening to allow fish. And the goal was to allow fish to move from um, poor quality estuary water downstream into the inlet to prevent fish kills. 
And there's also a propped gate that uh, is just a larger gate that can be opened uh, to allow seawater into the estuary. I'll also say there's this figure also shows some checkboards. Those checkboards are removed in winter and then added back in at the end of winter and they act to hold fresh water back. So raise the um, fresh water levels within the estuary. Now, the management of these gates is um, governed by uh, a partnership called the Vast Water Up Wetlands Partnership. And there is a group of management agencies and they decide how that gate is managed. And those gates have been managed consistently um, since 1990. And the 1990 management guidelines that were developed have um, generated a very distinct annual pattern within the estuary. And so I wanna tell you about that now. Before I do, I just point out, so I'm gonna be talking about water levels next and anyone can go and uh, look at the water level um, in the estuary. On the edge of each surge barrier, there's a staff gauge or it's just like a long ruler. You can read off the water level um, or we, we don't go out and read it every day. Um, we've had loggers installed in both estuaries for about the last 20 years um, to provide us with data. So I'll show you that data now. So here is a figure showing how the average water level varies in the VAS estuary over the course of the year. So on the x-axis, I have time. It starts in July and ends in July. So it's a whole year of data. And on the y-axis is the VAS water level. You could go on and read off that water level. The units are meters AHD. That's meters Australian height datum, where zero meters AHD is sea level. So negative numbers mean below sea level, positive numbers mean above sea level. Now what I've shown here is the black line is the average water level from our loggers over 1997 to 2014. It's about 20 years of data. And um, the reason I'm stopping in 2014 is because after 2014, we started changing the system. And so what I'm showing here is really how the estuary has been in the recent past. So the black line's the average, and then I'm shading in a purpley color to show the variation in levels that has been experienced over those years. So I hope what you can see at, in the, early on in the graph, um, around here in July and August, um, we have high water levels. Uh, also, there's a lot of variation within the shading, and that's because the water levels are very much influenced by the rainfall patterns that we get. But in general, we have high water levels associated with winter rainfall. To explain the rest of the graph, I'm going to shade it to make it a little bit easier. And so what we have is as the water levels um, are high at the end of winter, in around about September, the checkboards are added to the surge barrier, holding water back. Then the estuary is basically isolated from seawater. Water can't get in or out. It's isolated from the ocean, sorry. Water can't get in or out. And so what happens is the estuaries just evaporate. And you can see that we have this very slow and steady decline in water level uh, in the green section as evaporation drives a reduction in water level. Now, if that water level or if that was allowed to continue through into summer, the estuary would evaporate down to about negative 0.4 metres. So that would be right at the bottom of the scale. And that would happen by March. And at negative 0.4 metres, the estuaries, both estuaries are almost completely dry. There's really just a little bit of water left in the deeper parts of the channels close to the ocean. So uh, this was, the gates were completely closed in up until the 1980s. Um, and at the end of that time, concerned community, community members um, sort of agitated to try and allow some seawater into the estuary so that the estuary wouldn't completely dry up. And this is where the, some 1990 guidelines were established by Water Corporation, where after some consultation, they decided that uh, if the estuary reaches a level of negative 0.1 metres, the gates could be opened to allow seawater into the estuary, thereby preventing complete drying up. So that pink line shows where the water level target was over summer. And the gates were open just to maintain the water level at negative 0.1. And so as you can see, that red section, it's relatively flat, and it's also nowhere near as variable as the rest of the year. And that's because that's when basically, when management and gate management was controlling the water levels. 
So really very distinct time periods and different management in each season. How do these water level variations uh, impact the ecology? So I just have some pictures to show what happens at each time of year. So in upper left, um, during winter, the estuary is full. It's very beautiful. It's an important time for swans nesting. And it's also an important time for macrophytes or the, the seagrass to grow and flower. Um, then as the estuary level starts to decline into that green section, we start having mud flats appearing. And at the same time, we, the estuary receives a large number of visitors from international and resident migratory birds. And so we have a large number of birds arriving in the estuary and the estuary is able to support those large number of birds because of the wide range of both mud flat as well as open water habitat. And so we get our highest bird numbers in December and January during that green period of time. Then as we head into summer, the, even with the current guidelines, uh, much of the upper estuaries dry out and we end up with dry mud flats, as you can see in that photo. Also during the low water level period of time um, is when we have the highest number of algal blooms and fish kills. So that's when all our uh, negative sort of water quality events tend to happen. And so because this is happening at the same time as we're managing uh, the gates, um, this is what, after community uh, encouragement, caused the development of this program here that was funded under uh, Revitalising Geographic Waterways called the Vast Seawater Inflow Trial. And the goal of this trial, which started at the end of 2014, was to see if can the management of the vast surge barriers um, be changed to improve water quality in the channel. And so we've um, been do, undertaking uh, very definite studies since 2014 to try and answer this question. And we've done this by, in the last six years, um, using trialing four different ways of letting seawater into the estuary. Um, and we've trialed different ways in different years. And the ways of letting seawater into the estuary have varied from, in the first year, we just used the normal management, so letting water in at negative 0.1 metres. Um, but we've also tried letting no seawater in, letting seawater in sporadically every week, and then also letting seawater in early. So a whole range of uh, possibilities have been investigated. And so I'll tell you what we found um, shortly. Um, underpinning all of this has been very careful and intensive sampling. So I just before I show some results, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank all the samplers who've worked really hard collecting really high quality data. And here's a picture of the samplers in the channel, in their, in their boat, they travel up the estuary, they lower a, a probe that you can see on the uh, lower left there into the water to collect data such as temperature, salinity and oxygen. They collect water samples that are sent to a certified laboratory to give us nutrients. They also send us send uh, water samples to the Department of Water Phytoplankton Ecology Lab and their phytoplankton ecologists count and identify the phytoplankton. It's a very comprehensive suite of uh, analyses. So now I want to show you some key results um, from the early years that have really guided what we've done in later years of this trial. So I'm showing you some data from December 2015 and this was the year that we let seawater in weekly. And I'm gonna show you data from just 24 hours after we first opened the gates to let seawater in. And the data I'm showing you is salinity data. Salinity is how salty the water is. And I've plotted and I'm using a color scale to show that. And so on, the, on this graph that I'm showing you, on the x-axis is distance up the channel. Zero is the surge barrier. And then as we head to the right, we're heading up and along the channel for up to a kilometer. And then left of the surge barrier is the inlet. And so left of the surge barrier, the water's dark blue, 36 parts per thousand. That's seawater salinity. Then as you go to the right and you go over the surge barrier, we get into lower, lower salinity levels. And that's because we've just recently opened the, opened the gates. And so the salinity is not yet at seawater salinity. What we see is that the contours that I've plotted, so I've joined, I've joined lines of uh, points of equal salinity and generated contours. Well, you can see that the contours are all lying horizontal 
and that we have um, in within the estuary we have um, deeper water has higher levels of salinity and the salinity is li lying in layers and so this is called a salinity stratified system um, and this isn't that surprising because we've just we've just recently let seawater in. What is surprising is some of the other data that we've collected. So I'm now going to show you other contour plots, but of oxygen and temperature. So the top panel is the salinity I showed you. The middle panel is a contour plot of temperature. You can see there's not many lines. The temperature data is quite boring. The, the temperature is uniform everywhere. But then the oxygen data is we have a, a rainbow of colors. And so the oxygen data is very surprising to me because we have some regions of zero oxygen. So that is the red. So good levels of oxygen at this time of year would be around six to 10 milligrams per liter. So if the system was healthy, it would have all been colored gray or light blue. But we have some areas of zero oxygen and zero oxygen is lethal to aquatic organisms. Any aquatic organism that can't escape from zero is going to die. And fish start to struggle at oxygen levels of below four milligrams per litre. And so the whole lower part of this uh, vast channel is um, low in oxygen and would be detrimental to the health of the fish. So you can see that the oxygen uh, is also formed in layers. And that's because the oxygen um, the low oxygen is being driven by the salinity stratification. Because of the salinity stratification, the deep waters are isolated from the atmosphere. And so those deep waters um, are no longer able to get oxygen replenished from the atmosphere. And so they're losing oxygen. The deep waters are also in contact with the sediments. And so, and the sediments contain a lot of dead and decaying organic matter and algae. And as they decay, they consume oxygen and not enough oxygen supplied from the atmosphere. So we end up having no oxygen in the bottom waters. So this is not a good situation. If that area of red water starts to grow, then we could potentially get a fish kill. So uh, salinity stratification due to letting seawater in slowly is definitely not um, good for the water quality within the estuary. The following year, we had the opportunity to not let seawater in at all. And that's because the water level was fairly high. And so we kept the estuary fresh. And so here are the same figures, but for January 2017. And the upper plot is salinity. Um, you can see blue below the surge barrier because it's marine salinity. But then above the uh, surge barrier in the vast channel, there's no contour lines and that's because the salinity is all a uniform five, five parts per thousand, relatively fresh. Um, what is now um, surprising is that the temperature now is highly stratified. We have lots of horizontal lines of temperature. The water goes from 32 at the surface to 24 degrees at the bottom. And we think that temperature stratification developed because the having the gates closed means the estuary is just sitting there baking in the sun and it gets really hot. Now temperature stratification is just like salinity stratification. It leads to isolation of the bottom waters. Um, and so what you see with the oxygen is we've developed very intensive low oxygen re regions within the vast channel. So, and it actually happens not letting any seawater in has actually generated worse low oxygen than letting a little bit of seawater in. You can see that the low oxygen um, area is actually extended all the way about 1.4 kilometers up the channel. So very uh, not good conditions. So the low oxygen is very detrimental to aquatic life, but there's another reason we really don't like low oxygen. And that's because if we are to collect a water sample from those low oxygen re regions and have them analyzed in the lab, then the water comes back with high nitrogen and high phosphorus, in particular ammonium and phosphate. These are the most bioavailable or most delicious nutrients uh, for algal growth. And so when that water eventually gets mixed, it provides the perfect food to support uh, phytoplankton bloom. And that's exactly what we see. This is a picture taken about a week after that contour plot was, the data for the contour plot was collected. And you can see, as I've already pointed out, we have very green water upstream of the surge barrier. 
the phytoplankton ecology unit um, investigated what that green color was, and it's uh, from Anabinopsis anoldii. That's a blue-green algal, algal cell. And the concentrations reached almost half a million cells per mil. Incredibly high concentrations. That bloom spread all the way into the vast estuary, and you could see it on Landsat, Landsat satellites. So although it's caused by a microscopic organism, it got to such high concentrations, you could see it from space. And that's all because it was fueled by this like low oxygen areas that then generated nutrients that continued to fuel that bloom. So we've learned a few things in the, in the first three years. I just want to summarize that. And so we learned that letting seawater in slowly creates stratification. And stratification is not good because that then leads to low oxygen in the bottom waters and that drives nutrient release. The problem is, even when we don't let seawater in, the vast channel stratifies. It has a really strong tendency to stratify. We can, we realize, um, minimize some of the stratification by letting seawater in quickly. And just another piece of information is the first algal blooms start in late November and early December. So guided by this learnings that we had from the first three years, we have, um, we developed a new uh, way of letting seawater in that we started in 2017, in the summer of 2017-18. And in this um, trial, we opened the gates up in early December with the goal to interrupt that first algal bloom. And by keeping, getting the salinity up very high, we're much less likely to have blue-green algae blooming. And they're the ones that have been causing us all those problems. In order to try and prevent um, salinity stratification from happening, we opened both gates when we um, opened the gates. And we modelled all these scenarios very carefully to make sure we didn't adversely uh, flood any land or anything. And our modelling suggested that we couldn't keep both gates open all summer, but that we could keep the fish gate open all summer. And so we've kept the fish gate open all summer, and the goal of keeping that open is largely to have enough water movement to stop the temperature stratification from developing. And so we've done this uh, early December seawater inflow for the last three years. And so I want to show you how we've changed the water quality since we've been doing that. So this is a, a slide where I've counted up the number of hours of low oxygen that we've had in the Bass Channel. And I've just got each summer one to six listed over the top. And you can see from summers one to three, we had you know up to 200 hours, many equivalent days of time when we had almost low ox no oxygen in the bottom waters. Then summer four, where we first allowed seawater in in early December, the first summer we did that, we got no um, times where we had low oxygen. So we really thought we'd actually largely solved the system. But, and so that's why we've done the early seawater inflow um, in years five and six again, because things were looking really good. But we didn't, uh, we certainly didn't solve it completely because we did have some, some times where we had no oxygen in the bottom waters. But really the last three years we've had uh, we really have vastly reduced the number of hours of low oxygen that we've had. So we've improved the oxygen situation considerably. By improving the oxygen conditions significantly, we've reduced the amount of uh, nutrients that are released from the sediments. And so that, in combination with the higher salinity water, has improved our phytoplankton uh, cell situation. So here's a figure of the data from the phytoplankton counting. And on the x-axis is just time going from 2015 up to 2020. And I've shaded the summer in yellow just to make it a little bit easier to look at the graph. And on the y-axis is the number of cells per mil. So it's how many cells can be counted. And I'll note that the y-axis goes up to half a million cells. So these are anything that's plotting up towards the top of that axis is a thick pea, pea soup color. So you can see in the first three years, 2015, 16, and 17, we had a lot of red. Red is harmful phytoplankton species. And in the vast water up, that tends to be blue-green algae. And the problem with blue-green algae is they produce toxins that can be very detrimental to human and animal health. 
Then I've also plotted in grey phytoplankton that are not harmful. So the first three years we had very high and persistent levels of uh, harmful blue-green algae. Then the first year we let seawater in early, we had greatly reduced levels of phytoplankton, both harmful and non-harmful. And in the successive years, we've had very low levels of harmful algae, but we have had one pretty intensive bloom in 2019 of diatoms. Diatoms are another type of phytoplankton. They tend to be uh, marine in nature, and they're much less hazardous than uh, blue-green algae, and that's why they're called non-harmful. But at the level that we had in 2019, at 1.4 million cells, that level is definitely getting up to harmful to fish and other organisms. So we were lucky in 2019 not to have a fish kill. So because of that, let's have a look why we ended up with those high concentrations in 2019. And this just shows you that although letting seawater into the estuary early has improved the situation, we're really not in control of everything. And so let's look at what caused these 50 hours of low oxygen conditions. And it was from two events that happened over the course of the uh, summer number five. And the first event happened shortly after we opened the gate. We opened the gate, seawater came in, everything was looking great. But then a high pressure system came and sat over the Indian Ocean. And uh, that has the effect of lowering seawater. And so the ocean level was very low. And so we weren't able to get seawater into the estuary. And so what we actually did was create the exact situation we were trying not to have, where we'd let a little bit of seawater in um, and then let it sit and fester. And that's exactly what it did. Um, the seawater we'd let in stratified, we ended up with low oxygen, high nutrients, and the salinity was high enough that we didn't get blue-green algae, but we got diatoms and they grew up to 1.4 million cells per mil. Um, that if that situation had persisted, we very likely would have got a fish kill. Luckily, the high pressure system moved off, ocean level rose, we were able to get seawater in, and that bloom was flushed away. And so um, nothing happened. So we were very lucky there. But it shows you we're not in control. Ocean level is really important in the management of this system, and we don't have control over that. The second event happened at the end of the summer, um, and the sandbar closed. Water Corporation do a great job in keeping that sandbar open, but that also can be very difficult to keep open at times. And so having the sandbar closed uh, led to the water uh, stopping, stopping its movement and that generated times of low oxygen as well. But overall, um, we have improved the water quality significantly within the vast channel. Now, the vast channel is really important from that it tends to have fish kills and algal blooms, but it's the rest of the estuary that really has the very important ecological values that we uh, you know, treasure about these estuaries. And so it's important to see how our management solutions for the vast channel has impacted the rest of the estuary. So everything that I've been talking to you about so far has mainly been at this site, VASI 1, the upper right-hand corner there. And so let's have a look at what, um, how we've changed conditions at some of these other sites within the vast estuary. And all of the estuary is impacted by, by having the fish gate open. The water level in autumn is about 10 centimetres higher than it used to be in the last 20 years. 10 centimetres doesn't sound like very much, but it's a very flat, shallow system. So it is actually quite important. So in the vast channel, the salinity um, rise is now happening in early December and that's about three to four weeks earlier than used to happen on average. As that salinity, the salt wedge moves up the estuary, um, it takes some time. So by the time we get to the mid-estuary, <coughs> excuse me, the salinity rises about two to three, we, two to three weeks earlier than it used to. Um, some other significant changes in the mid-estuary. Uh, previously, the mid-estuary used to get up to 100 parts per thousand by the end of summer. And that's because the water would just um, evaporate away and we'd end up with salinities about three times the salinity of salt water. Now we have some seawater coming in. And so the last three years, the salinity has been about 65 parts per thousand. So it's still way higher than seawater, but not as intensively so. Probably the, some of the biggest changes are in the upper estuary. 
and the upper estuary, VW26, that would typically be dry after mid-January under the 1990 management guidelines. But in the last three years, that has stayed wet all summer at a salinity of about 70 parts per thousand, so two times seawater. So what we've done, we've raised the salinity earlier and kept the estuary wetter. And so the, the problem with this change is that it's all happening in December. And in December is when we have the, the peak of the bird numbers. And so it's very important to understand what are the ecological impacts of um, having this early seawater inflow. And so in, since 2017, as part of the Revitalising Geographic Waterways program, there's been seasonal sampling of fish, birds, benthic invertebrates, and seagrasses and macroalgae. And I recommend, if you haven't already seen them, um, the two previous webinars in this series were on fish and the seagrasses. So I recommend looking at those talks and just, um, as they are discussed in uh, the previous webinars. And next month um, will be the talk on uh, on water birds and so um, I encourage you to tune in next week to next month sorry to find out about water birds but um, it's very important that we understand how our changes in the gate management are impacting the ecology of the system and so I'll just um, tell you how it what we found with water birds and saying that Kim Williams um, who will be giving the webinar next month is going to say a lot more about water birds but I just want to show you some of the challenges in managing this system. Here's the bird numbers over the last uh, five years and again I've shaded the summer periods in yellow and I've labelled how we had things managed and um, we don't have any data in the first year but what we have is a highly variable um, bird numbers. You can see we only had um, three years of very high bird numbers. Um, in, the f in the summer of year three, where we didn't let any seawater in, had very good bird numbers. Then the first year of seawater inflow, um, the bird numbers were, were not very good. So that caused us concern. But the water up bird numbers were also relatively low. So we don't know if those bird numbers are due to the seawater inflow. In summer of year five, we had um, very good bird numbers at first, but as, once we opened the gates, the birds disappeared. So summer of year five caused us uh, additional concern. And then summer of year six, we were sufficiently concerned that the vast Warner Up Wetland Partnership, the group uh, responsible with uh, managing and making decisions about the gates for these wetlands, was sufficiently concerned that we decided to try a hybrid early seawater inflow where we tried to, we opened the gates early, but we, once the channel was at marine salinity, we closed the gates to try and slow the progression of salt water so that the estuary remained fresh over December. Um, that didn't work. We were unable to slow the progression of salt water, but we did have a really good bird year with some of the highest bird numbers uh, recorded for December. So over the course of the three years of early seawater, we've had some average good and bad data. So it's still very unclear how the ecology is reacting to this early seawater inflow. And it might be several years until um, some effects on some of the other ecological components are actually observed. So just to conclude, um, I'd like to say we've gone from a situation in the vast channel where we have a thick green stinking waterway to, as shown in January 2015, to a much more respectable um, waterway shown in January 2018. So we really have significantly improved the water quality in the vast channel. Unfortunately, um, it's unclear what the ecological impacts of the rest of the estuary are. Um, how, it's unclear how the ecology reacts to this early seawater that we've done in the vast channel. So there may be a balancing act between improving channel water quality and estuary ecology. This coming summer, um, the Vast Water Up Wetland Partnership, which is a partnership between the agencies that uh, are responsible for the wetlands, that's Water Corporation, City of Busselton, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, and Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and, and Attractions. So there are managers from that group in the Vast Water Up Wetland Partnership 
they're responsible for taking into account all of the information and they decide how the gates are to be managed. They have decided, uh, following advice from the science advisory group, to have another summer of early seawater inflow. So we gain the benefits of the improved channel water quality, but we're going to continue to collect ecological data so that uh, if we show signs of detrimental impacts to the ecology, we can alter our gate management as needed. So that's all I wanna say. I would just like to acknowledge there's been a huge number of people involved in uh, developing, then collecting the data and analyzing the data. So I'd like to um, acknowledge all the people in the Bustleton and Bunbury and Perth Department of Water and Environmental Regulation who've done work on this. And also to thank the Science Advisory Group who are um, scientists from Murdoch University, Edith Cowan University, Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, and Atelier Ecology, who provide their time to provide advice on the science and the ecology of this system. And uh, that allows us to use the, have the best science and the data to um, help improve the management of this system. And um, that is all I would like to say. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if there are, I guess, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. That's great, Linda. Thank you. Um, if you end your screen share now, we will go to question time. There's Kath who can help answer too. Um, so all our viewers, if you have some questions, you can click the chat um, button at the bottom of your screen and type them in there. Um, and I'm sure um, you're itching to ask Linda some questions. That was so comprehensive, Linda, that all my backup questions I had to keep crossing off as you went. Oh, she's answered that one. So um, that's fine. But what, what I was um, interested to know, do you think that we're um, on our way to having a recipe that's a, you know, a one size fits that we can do each year or in the long term, will, it'll still be a year by year thing to manage this system in, in how dynamic it is? Oh, that's a good question, Sally. I mean, it would be better to have a recipe that could be applied each year. But right now, I'm not sure that that's possible because we're still collecting that ecological data to understand what our impacts are. Mm. And so we can't necessarily let our water quality decisions in the Bass Channel guide what we do because it may be detrimental to the estuary. So we certainly, for the next uh, at least the next year, need to continue collecting uh, data before we can make a comment on that. Uh, Kath, do you? I can see. Do you have something to um, add? Oh, Kath, unmute yourself, Kath. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm laughing a little bit, Sal, because when I first became involved with Bass One Up after a major fish kill in 2013, I thought we could solve it. Um, so that's seven years now, um, and the more I know, the less I know. So every time we think we have this system sorted, it throws us a curveball. So um, we're still dedicated. Linda and I have got a few more years left to um, keep watching it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kath and Linda. Um, we've got a question here from Tim Storer. Do we have any data on changes in metals or other toxicants and their release? with the different management regimes, um, particularly with relation to changes in anoxia in bottom waters and sediment, Linda? Um, so we do not specifically associate it with the varied, um, with the varied uh, gate management, have, we have not specifically sampled for toxicants. Um, I would say, and we ha the toxicants have been sampled in the past and the levels were relatively low and were certainly not concerning. I would say any movement to reduce anoxia is going to improve, um, well, that's a tough question actually, Tim. Um, that, <laughs> now I think about it. Um, any reduction in anoxia is going to improve the health of the sediments and so is likely to have more iron oxides and immobilize some of those toxicants. So I would say, if anything, we've improved the toxicant concentrations in the sediments, but we've not measured that. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, we have a question here from Peter. 
do large variations in rainfall or heavy falls out of season cause troubles with salinity or algae? So I guess some big summer storm events. Those yes, definitely. That's a great question. Um, especially in um, summer, um, summer rainfalls tend to deliver a lot of nutrients to the estuary and often are responsible for some of the macroalgal blooms, the large areas of um, the estuary that get choked with that, that weed. And it also, so just providing fresh nutrients to a system when it's really warm is always going to be problematic from a water quality point of view. Mm. So yes, definitely an issue and often something we can't really do too much about. Mm. Right. Thank you. Um, a question from Catherine McMahon. Thanks, Linda, for a very informative and interesting presentation. Um, Catherine has a question about how the low sea level resulted in low oxygen in the vast channel. Is there anything you can do when there is a low sea level to minimise the chance of low oxygen concentrations? For example, could you make the opening to the ocean deeper? Is that a um, Kath or a Linda question? <laughs> Yeah, so I, well, I'd just like to acknowledge Catherine McMahon, who just asked this question, who is a member of the science advisory group. So um, thank you for joining, Catherine, and thank you for being on the science advisory group. And so it's very hard to control the dynamics of that sandbar opening. So I think we could go and deepen it, but it's likely it would sediment up like before we actually needed it to be deep. So I think my guess is it's pretty hard to control that. Um, I think to us, uh, so I think we're a little bit at the mercy of the ocean levels. The thing about it in summer, it doesn't last that long. So if we are able to have the system so it's resilient enough to sort of last for one or two weeks, although the water quality is declining, that it doesn't get so bad, then we know eventually that ocean level will come back and we'll be able to get seawater in eventually if the estuary level is at a fairly sort of an average level. Um, I know there has been examples in the past where the ocean level has been really, really low um, and it has been tough, but um, by opening the gates earlier, it means the estuary level matches the ocean level earlier in the season. And so we're less likely to have those events where we can't get seawater in. It will still happen, but we'll have them less often. Yeah, Thanks, I might Linda. just add to that, Linda. Um, one of the challenges we've realised over the years with the, the ocean levels is that sometimes, particularly if we open in December, we have to let a lot of fresh water out. And that's really hard. And it's particularly hard on residents who live nearby seeing all this quite nice fresh water going out to the system. So that, that's really hard, I find, as a manager, to, to let all that good fresh water out. So. Yeah, we're kind of learning that the ocean levels are a really big challenge. Mm. Thanks, Linda and Kath. Um, a question, a great question here from um, Vern Bussell. Would it be possible to lower the fish gates so it didn't just operate at high tides and so less fish are caught by pelicans and other predators as, if, as fish move through the very shallow water? So I guess, could the fish gate be deeper down in the, on the gate? Theoretically, yes. Um, logistically, I think that would be a big discussion in terms of the engineering um, because there's no, um, re the, I don't see why the fish gate couldn't be deeper. It, um, Kath, do you? I, I kind of like pelicans, Vern. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of one of those challenges you, you captured it beautifully you know are we managing the system for fish or are we managing it for birds so yeah look part of that system when it dries up they talk about we've seen these pelican frenzies of eating fish it's pretty impressive so I feel a bit sorry for the fish but I quite like the pelicans so it's just those challenges of managing this system you've got to stop sometimes and think what are we actually managing it for so if you're managing it for birds you probably wouldn't need to but if you're managing it for fish you know maybe but Good question, Vern. <laughs> um, I'm just going to cut in there and do a quick time check because we've gone past our 6.45 finish time. So if anyone does need to leave now, um, you can do so. Please remember um, to fill in the two-minute survey that pops up on your screen. Otherwise, um, we can keep going. We've got one more question here 
from Dave and Kylie. Oh, another one's popped up too. Uh, from Dave and Kylie, if the gates were created to prevent f flooding, what detriments would there be to leaving the gates open all the time unless there was a threat of flooding? Linda or Kath? I, I, I kind of like that one. Can I take that one? Yeah, please. Um, the thing that we're learning about this system is I think the thing that makes it so attractive to birds is that diversity of habitats. So what we've learned when we have, the, if we let, there's a, there's a mindset out there that we probably all have, more water, more birds. It doesn't actually work that way. So if we keep those gates open all summer, one, we can uh, impact on surrounding vegetation. It's not just pasture, there's some really nice native vegetation. So we've seen that before when the gates have been accidentally left open back in the 90s, a lot of vegetation died. Because these gates have been in for 100 years, so the ecology has actually changed dramatically. But what letting in a lot of water in summer, what we're finding now is that non-drying might have an impact on the, the aquatic plants. So we're just seeing a change in the aquatic plants at the top of the vast estuary with letting more water in. So that's a little bit of a concern. But I always think of it like um, it's a little bit like a food hall. So if you think of this as the puddle, as it evaporates, you've got these muddy edges and different water levels, and it creates this smorgasbord for all these different birds. And until you're out there seeing it, you just don't realise how fantastic it is. When we leave all that water in, it, it sort of just makes it like fish and chips, you know? So it only just makes it one, one thing. So we take away that habitat diversity. So what we're learning from this is not, more water doesn't necessarily mean more birds or better habitat. So it's that variability that we would lose if we just let the water stay in. So that's our learning at the moment. Great, thanks Kath, that was a great explanation. Fish and chips, I'll remember that one. Um, I was just curious to know, Linda and Kath, what, what further research needs do you think we have? Uh, it, do we still have gaps or is it a matter of consolidating what we do have? I think we still need um, to better understand the ecological so I showed you, you know, we've had three very variable years of bird data. Birds are naturally variable. And so we, we really need to um, have more understanding of that. But there's also um, the balance between fresh and salt water impacts the sea grasses and the macroalgae. All of that is you know, three years of data just isn't enough to understand that in a system that's really variable. So it's the ecological um, response that we're still working on. For sure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you mentioned, Linda, about the drying in the upper estuary. Is that, is that one of the things that they'd be able to determine? I was curious to know if the, um, if the change in the regime and then the, the dry upper estuaries would, would have impacts and can we measure that? Um, yes, we can try. So the upper estuaries are less dry now in the last few oh, less years. Dry less dry because we've raised the water level about 10 centimetres. And so one thing that has done is it's made the vast estuary less intensively salty. And so that is likely to benefit organisms that are living there because it's very hard to live in such salty conditions. But having the, you could, we don't know this, having a sediment dry might help burn off some of the nutrients. And so now it's wet, that might not happen. But also under wet conditions, we may actually encourage more processes that also help remove nutrients. So we really don't know the balance of good and bad associated with keeping sediments wet versus dry. And that's, that's a definitely another area of research that we um, hope to do start this summer because that, that is an important uh, sort of uh, aspect of this situation to understand um, what sort of, how does it impact nutrient budgets keeping things wet versus dry. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. We've got a, um, a lot of comments coming up saying thank you. Fantastic talk, Linda. Um, is there any other further comments, Linda or Kathy, you want to add? I think it was such a comprehensive presentation. Uh, I, I guess it's, it's really nice to see how many people were interested in this talk tonight. It's, it's been a really big program for us um, at the Department of Water and it's something that I've been personally pretty interested in and um, we, it's a beautiful system and the more people care about that system and are interested in it, the, the better we will have and that the, you know, we've been very lucky with funding 
through the Revitalising Geograph Waterways program. And that's really been because of the community interest in these systems. So keep up that interest, I would say. It's, um, it's really heartening for people like ourselves who work in the system that so many people are interested. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kath. Thanks, Linda. Um, I don't see any more burning questions popping up, so um, I think we can end the session now. There's a lot of great information on the Revitalising Geograph Waterways website, um, or we do have um, the Ecological Snapshot, which is um, some information from 2017, which is also um, on the RGW website. So um, um, we can end the session there. Please make sure you fill in the two-minute survey that will pop up on your screen when, you, when the session ends. But otherwise, um, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Kath. Much appreciated. So, thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.